Hello everyone and welcome to the weird, scary and horrible parts of humanity. Today we are looking into the tragic murder of Filipina mail order bride Susanna Remata by Timothy Blackwell, which so easily could have been prevented. Born in Katingan in the Philippines in 1969, Susanna Remata was one of two daughters. Her parents owned a store in Katainan, where she worked as a cashier. She was seen as a petite, talkative, and effusive girl. An honor student at Katainan National High School, she studied nursing and then hotel and restaurant management in Cebu, 12 hours away by ferry. She returned home almost every weekend. She was also a local beauty queen and was crowned Miss Katainan, Miss Masbate, and was a contestant for Miss Cebu. But she had a dream of moving to the United States of America. She always talked about finding an American husband and settling down for a better life. While studying in Cebu, an elderly woman who acted as a matchmaker for Asian Encounters owned by Jerry Davis convinced 21-year-old Rimata to sign up to Asian Encounters, a catalogue which allowed Filipino women to find American partners. Perceiving that they had nothing to lose, Rimata and her friends decided to give it a go. In the April to May 1990 issue of Asian Encounters, Ramata's ad read, Susanna, age 21, 5 feet 3 inches, 105 pounds, Philippines, Roman Catholic, hotel and restaurant management, hobbies, dancing, reading, and cooking. Soon afterwards, Ramata and her friends visited a palm reader who told Ramata that her future husband would not be Filipino and would be from another country. Ramata became incredibly popular and received an average of 13 letters a day from hundreds of American pen pals. She caught the eye of Timothy C. Blackwell in 1990, a lab technician from Seattle, Washington, who was born in Montana and lived in a studio apartment in northern Seattle. Blackwell was desperate for a life partner and had resorted to computer and catalogue matching services, with the internet still very much in its infancy. He had written to 24 women from Asian encounters, and only half had responded. Perhaps June Myers, a then board member of the Seattle-based organization the Asian Pacific Islanders Women and Family Safety Center, summarized it perfectly in an interview with the New York Times, stating, The men who use this sort of service are usually losers. A Filipina women's group found that most of the men utilizing mail-order bride services were often socially or physically unattractive in their own culture, held chauvinistic attitudes, had histories of abuse or physical disabilities. However, in the 1990s, mail-order brides were not uncommon in the Philippines, with Filipina women considered attractive to American men due to their ability to speak English and familiarity with Western ways and culture. Nearly 20,000 Filipina women left their home country as fiancés of foreigners in 1995, with 5,000 heading for America. This was despite the 1990 Republic Act 6955 banning mail order brides in the Philippines, with numerous women subjected to abuse, including 18 Filipina women who were mail order brides killed between 1985 and 1996 in Australia. Companies got around this by changing their label to pen pal clubs, and the law remained symbolic in name only. One year after Blackwell started communicating with Ramata, she ceased communicating with other men and only talked with Blackwell. In March 1993, following a year of communication consisting of 40 letters, occasional phone calls and cassette tapes, Blackwell flew to the Philippines, arriving in Cebu on the 3rd of March 1993. He then took the ferry to Katainan and met Ramata on the 6th of March 1993. Just three days later, they were engaged. The pair were married at the St. Vincent's Church in Katainan on the 31st of March 1993. By this stage, Ramata was 23 years old 
and Blackwell was nearly double her age at 45 years old. Blackwell was disappointed with Ramata despite marrying him, telling her that her English was broken, she was not as attentive to him in her letters, and that she spent too much time with her friends. Furthermore, he was angered by her spending habits, spending $2,000 on the wedding, $2,000 on the reception, and $600 for a TV and VCR for Ramata's parents. He even tried to book a flight back to Seattle and broke off the wedding plans, but Ramata persuaded him to stay with the pair having sex for the first time in order to make him stay. A religious Ramata stated, I really loved him. That's why I agreed to marry him in the eyes of the people and in the eyes of God. Just one day after their marriage, during their honeymoon, Blackwell raised his voice and attempted to choke his partner after they missed a ferry back to Cebu. Ramata became concerned for her safety but continued on her ill-fated journey to the United States of America. Her mother, Marcella Ramata, implored her daughter not to go to the United States of America with Blackwell, but she insisted that she still loved him. Blackwell flew back to the United States of America in mid-1993 following his honeymoon and Ramata joined him a year later, arriving on the 5th of February 1994, moving into a rented apartment in Kirkland, Seattle. Upon arrival, Ramata was subjected to constant physical abuse with her husband allegedly impotent. She was also constantly threatened with deportation. Blackwell also became infuriated with Ramata because she was allegedly disinterested in him and constantly asking for money. He described her as cold, distant, uncommunicative, and she slept fully clothed. Thirteen days after her arrival, on the 18th of February 1994, the pair divorced when Blackwell choked and struck Ramata, pushing her head into the sink. Ramata called the police and Blackwell was charged with misdemeanor assault, which was dropped when she failed to turn up to court. An infuriated Blackwell claimed that Ramata scammed him into marriage so that she could get to, into the United States of America and ultimately get American citizenship. He filed an annulment to get her deported. He offered to drop it if she paid him $17,000, which he claimed he had paid in communicating with Ramata. Ramata moved in with two Filipina friends, Phoebe Dyson, aged 46, living in Seattle, pictured to the left, and Veronica Loretta Johnson, aged 42, living in Mount Lank Terrace, pictured to the right. Both women provided refuge for Ramata. Dyson came from Masbate in the Philippines, the same island as Ramata. Dizon was married and had three children, while Johnson worked in insurance sales and had two children. Ramata filed for an annulment and sought $350 per month in annulment for six months as she was pregnant. She claimed that she was raped at a party, while Blackwell's lawyers claimed that the baby was that of a Filipino boyfriend and that she had fallen pregnant in an attempt to keep her in the country. On the 2nd of March 1995, the disgruntled pair headed to the King County Courthouse, by which stage Ramata, now 25, was 8 months pregnant. Blackwell, now 47, testified that he felt very responsible because I brought a disease into this country. Ramata was supported in court by her friends Dizon and Johnson, who planned to testify just minutes before the closing arguments, Blackwell walked up to the three women and shot them in the chest, abdomen and head before being wrestled to the ground by three guards from a nearby courtroom. All three women were killed and Ramata's eight-month-old fetus did not survive. At the time, Blackwell had an extra ammunition clip in his hand and planned to commit suicide with an envelope containing $650 in his briefcase, his will and a testament confessing his guilt. There were no metal detectors in the two public entrances in the King County Courthouse. Judges had asked for better security systems in 1992, but these were not implemented until after the killings, which so easily could have saved the three women and Ramata's daughter.
Ramata's corpse was taken back to the Philippines and buried in her hometown. Her mother stated in interviews with the press, Never mind Blackwell, leave Blackwell to God. God will know what to do with him. Blackwell's defence was that he had an unhappy childhood and had been beaten by his grandfather, noting that he had no prior criminal history. On the 24th of June 1996, aged 47, Blackwell was sentenced to life in prison. Thank you for watching. Please do yourself a favour and hit that like and subscribe button and the bell icon to inform you when new videos come out. It helps more than you know and your support is truly appreciated. You'll also be seeing two other videos for you to check out. Until next time, stay awesome, stay classy, be kind to everyone you meet and have an amazing day.